I'm going to talk today about research I did 10 years ago. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about my research because the way I did it, it was a little bit uh, unorthodox. And then I'm going to talk about some thoughts that I have um, on my methods and <coughs> how it kind of relates from a different angle to the question of perpetrators. Since I'm kind of trying to figure out the structure of this paper, I'd be really happy to hear comments about structure or anything else that uh, comes to mind. So uh, yesterday we talked a little bit about the difference, like starting to do um, more local uh, research. And uh, Shell, who's not here right now, was saying how he's always doing like this big human rights um, studies that are far, far away. And a lot of anthropologists are doing similar projects. And um, I was trained as Latin American uh, anthropologist. And as I was working on political violence in um, mostly the Southern Cone, a lot of um, sexual violence in situation of terror um, came to mind uh, through my reading, through interviews. <coughs> and I start accumulating more and more uh, accounts about it. At the same time, I was uh, living in Jerusalem during the Second Intifada. Buses, supermarkets, coffee shops up in the air every second day. Um, and on the other hand, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, is um, applying different methods of oppression towards the Palestinian um, population in the occupied territories. Um, and of course, in my mind, we're talking about 2003, um, there's this record of, of wars that are just sort of ending in Rwanda, in the Balkans, <coughs> in Chechnya, in Darfur, and all of them has like massive amount of sexual assaults. So in my mind, while I'm working on a project about political violence in Latin America, I constantly question what is the situation where I'm at. And starting to do like a side uh, research for myself, it was more trying to figure out things without no connection to research. But then eventually the pile of notes that I had on the uh, little side research became much bigger than my MA pile of notes, so I had to switch them. Um, and this is how this became my MA thesis. Um, so my question for my MA thesis was uh, about the rarity of military rape in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because this is what I found out when I start doing this little side research, that it's really, really, really rare. And uh, I was able to find several cases. I will mention them um, later on. But um, really not something substantial and has nothing to do in, in relation to um, different conf conflicts that were happening at the same time. So I found it really interesting, and my, um, and my research was mainly based on interviews with soldiers. So basically, I had to figure out how to take this pile of notes that was only for me and make it into a research. So how do you study absence? The first thing I had to figure out is if it's possible to study violence. Is it like a valid question? The second thing, I had to create some kind of a framework for something that exist. What is sexual violence in conflict? Uh, how, how common it is? What are the main um, explanation? And so on. The third thing I was trying to understand is, is it really rare? Like, is there absence? And how do I prove it? The fourth thing, that's not me, uh, was um, how <coughs> Um, how do I study it? How do I approach it in a scientific way to, to kind of gather knowledge or data about something that I claim is rare or absent? So um, these are the things that I dealt with back then. And they created this question of absence, created a whole different method uh, that I had to kind of figure out in order to study this. But what I want to talk about today, or add to this conversation, is questions that came up later in relation to doing anthropology at home 
And in relation to a question that came up after my research, when people were asking me about the interviews and they were saying, oh, that might have been horrible. And my response was like, no, it was actually a lot of fun. The interviews were really amusing and like really went on with good spirit and people would ask, but what's so funny about rape? And of course, the issue was not that rape is funny. Rape is not funny. No one thinks that rape is funny. Definitely no one thinks that um, wartime rape is funny. Um, the more um, funny anecdote came in a different part of the interview, in the, mo in the major part of the interview. Um, so I will talk about it in a sec. But first, how can we decide that um, study of absence is actually valid? So study of, of absence is problematic because why would someone study something that doesn't exist to begin with? Um, and on top of it, when we talk about something like a crime or something that is considered to be very marginalized, our assumption is that this is abnormal. So the normality is that it will not happen. Why would you question it? So in order to question it, I had to kind of explain that this is, there is all of this literature that shows that wartime rape is endemic to war. Like it happens a lot and create, explain all the mechanism that <coughs> made war uh, almost producing or invoking um, sexual violence. Um, so the first part was actually talking about the study of absence, is it possible, is it not possible? Then I went to create this huge survey of everything possible that I could read about military rape and about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because I was trained as Latin Americanist. I grew up in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was formed by it, but I, I'm not like academically educated. So I had to read about both of these things and kind of create corpse of knowledge before I go and talk about the absence. So through these readings, I, I established a whole new uh, understanding of wartime rape, much more complex. And I start creating um, s sort of um, framework, analytical framework of, <coughs> of why and, and what are the conditions that create military rape. And of course, we're not saying that all men are just waiting to go to war in order to finally have a shot of getting rape, of, of participating in rape. But, and not all, all victims are women. There are a lot of men are victimized as well. Um, some of the people who inflict sexual violence on both men and women are women, not only men. Um, there are a lot of complexities and a lot of forms of military rape. And I try to explain how they, they take place and, and how they're related to different kinds of conflicts. So I, I talked about the, like, several main factors that, 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 um, that impact military rape. I talked about um, characteristic of the conflict. Is it prolonged? Is it about territory? Is it ideological? And things like that. I talked about the nature of the organization. Is it established army? Is it a guerrilla group? And so on. And I talked about natures of the, um, of the populations. And bearing in mind that each conflict is unique because these things intersect differently. And that conflicts are not fixed. That these things constantly change. So what we see in the first phase of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very different than what we saw in, I saw in 2003. So I basically divided the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for to uh, five major phases and looked at them and their probability of creating different kinds or types of military rape. <coughs> I also looked at military rape in relation to group boundaries, and I talked about 
how um, um, social boundaries, um, group affiliation, um, hierarchy between different groups, and um, sharing similar space are creating or preventing it. And I divide it into two main uh, categories, uh, intentional or systemic rape and symptomatic rape. When we talk about the intentional rape, we usually talk about cases like we saw in the Balkans when there is an attempt to separate between two groups. Um, so two groups are kind of, they're not necessarily clear about affiliation, they're not necessarily clear about uh, hierarchies, but they share space. So through rape, you create a group that is the rapist and the group that is the raped. You know who is who and what are their relationships. And, um, and a situation that is symptomatic, like you would see in Iraqi um, US arms in Iraq, they get into a place, <coughs> there's a house, they rape a woman. And because it's possible, because the, um, because the war enables different forms of violence, but then they burn the house with the family because they don't want to spread terror. They want to hide the act. So in this case, the rape displays those uh, group affiliation. It shows that they know, the soldiers and the Iraqi civilians, they know that they are different groups and they know the, um, the power relations. The US soldiers can burn the whole household because all of these people are worthless for them if you compare them. They don't see them as something that is valuable. So <coughs> they can just dispose them. And it's very different from the intentional rape that like Jeff talked about yesterday is a means of, of spreading uh, terror. Here there's no intention to spread terror to make, like in Guatemala they would do that. They would do uh, gang rape in the middle of the village and then tell them if you're not leaving tomorrow we're gonna come and rape a few more women. So that would make people leave. Here the intention is not to make people leave, is not to separate population, it's just a practice that is enabled. Um, so that was my, my uh, theoretical um, framework and I looked at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and tried to see how it works and doesn't work and in which phases of the conflict which thing would be more probable. And <coughs> in 2003, we're looking more towards the symptomatic rape. Uh, while in, 2000, in, in the beginning, in, in, in the 40s, in 47 or 48, around the establishment of the state, when there are no clear armies, like no established military, and, and it's much more, um, they're not even two entities, then you look more at a situation that can create um, systemic rape, and we do have several cases back then, but they're not, they're not uh, practiced in the systemic way. They are practiced in the symptomatic way, meaning that all the women, except maybe one, who were raped were murdered, and the thing were, um, the evidence were, were hidden as much as possible. So it was not something that was meant to create terror. It was, it was expression of violence in the middle of, of massacre or something like that. So that was my um, studying of the extent. And um, then I had to um, go and find a way, before going and finding a way of how to study the absence, I try to make sure that actually I'm not making it up. So I went back to the literature and tried to figure out in all those other um, conflict zones where rape was reported, who were the people who reported it? And I, I found through agents of report. One was the women themselves. The second was soldiers, either during or after. And the third were human rights um, organizations. So um, I went back to Israel and tried to see if all of these agents exist if, and if they have the agency to report. And I saw very similar situations. So the conditions were, 
were there to report. So I assume that it's possible for them to report. Uh, and still don't have any reports, so yes, there is a rarity and absence of military rape. Um, then I try to figure out how to address the question. I, even though I wanted to do uh, participant observation, there's several options for me to do it. I chose not to do it and to do interviews. I'm not going to get into it because I want to jump to the end. Um, there's a lot of it about it in my paper. And I did interviews with 25 soldiers, reserve soldiers, and I heard all kinds of things related to violence in those interviews. But um, none of the people talked about uh, rape. And it's, it was really interesting because the way I created the interview was um, first I asked, I never said that it's going to be about military rape. I talked about um, their service within civilian population with a focus on women. So the interview would be um, talking to them quite openly about their uh, openly, I mean, it was not a script uh, interview, about their service. So what was it that you were doing? Each one of them served somewhere else in a different time, in a different unit, in a different rank. Uh, what was it were you doing? And um, so they were telling me a little bit about their work, the way it's called is work. And then I would kind of take them towards my interest, which is sexual violence try to ask about women, try to see if there is any um, physical involvement, anything that they could um, say about it. And then if they didn't get what I'm saying, I would just say it. And then usually they would get really, really mad. And um, then I would just explain that this is something very common. So, I would kind of take over, if the first part of the interview, I would give them the seat of the expertise, I would switch and become the expert. So you are the expert in this conflict situation, and now I'm the expert of this academic feminist literature about um, conflict time sexual assault. And once I establish this uh, authority of uh, of my scholarship, we were able to have this conversation almost between equals. Like I had my own expertise, they had their own expertise, and became a really, really interesting conversation. Um, so yes, they told me a lot about other forms of violence that they were involved in. They're not happy always about it. A lot of them were really uncomfortable with things that they did. Um, but they definitely did not say anything about sexual assault, and they found it really, really repulsive. Um, what was really interesting for me when I was writing it is that all of, all of these conversations had a lot of humor anecdote through them. And when I tried to read through them, <coughs> um, one of the things that I, I thought about is that this is a source of maybe test. Like, they're trying to figure out where I stand. Um, who am I? Do I understand the situation? So through these anecdotes that I wish were here, um, I tried to, I, I went back to my literature, my Latin Americanist literature, and um, looked at both Diane Nelson's work and Diana Goldstein's work, and thought about the meaning of, of uh, laughter in relation to uh, exploring complexities and in relation to creating identification. So one of the things that I talked about was how through these very um, amusing anecdotes, um, these soldiers were able to tell me multi-layered stories that they could not just tell me if we were in this ongoing conversation because there's so many layers of racism and classism and gender that when you tell the story, disappear. And through these um, humor humoristic anecdotes, things came out, 
but they were not as harsh as they would be if they would just tell me, the Palestinians are very poor. It, this was never mentioned, um, but it was mentioned through the stories, through the kind of cars that they would have and, and things like that. Um, so in this sense, it was almost like a test for me because I had to figure out all of these hints in their stories. And when I was doing this, I was showing them that I belong to the same culture that they belong to, that we share similar understanding. And in this case, the kind of um, anthropology at home that I did was different than anthropology at home that others are doing. Because when we do anthropology at home, a lot of times we study that faraway sect. Yes, it is in the Canadian society, but it's the downtown east side. Um, but what I did was studying my own core group. I studied mainstream Israeli society that served in the Israeli army. <coughs> so I was really reflecting upon myself. And through this process of identification, it made me realize how I am connected to them. So two things happened. The first thing is that when I understood the joke, they could understand me as affiliated to them and trust me. The other thing that happened is that I had a whole different understanding of the situation that I was describing because now I understood that I'm writing about myself. That the only thing that separates me from them is that I was born with XX and they were born with XY because that's the whole thing, right? I, was, I got to serve in not combat um, role just because I was a woman. If I, had I been a man, I'd be in their position. Uh, many of these people are sharing the same political uh, viewpoints that I share and uh, a really similar place in society uh, like me. So I would have been in the same place. And it really made me reflect on that and be very cautious about what I'm saying later on. Um, so again, I'm asking about absence, but I hear all of these complex stories and I have this sense of identification that creates trust and also make me very uh, conscientious about my place and my uh, position within the study. But another thing that it brings out is this question of perpetrators. And I think this is the main thing here because through these, these practices of humor, first, a lot of these stories was, were created as, as a game. It's not a war. It's a game. A lot of things were created as moralistic. Um, they are thieves. They are stupid. Like creating this sense of uh, that population is bringing upon themselves. Um, but also this a constant assertion that um, there's a difference between acts of violence and they were only doing work. They were only doing um, acceptable acts, legitimate, normative, legal acts of violence that were serving the country. And everything that is different, that would have put them in the perpetrator chair. And through these mechanisms, they tried to convince me that they don't belong in that chair. And also remind me that if they belong in that chair, I go there too. 